of Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. And as you're turning there, I just want to share just a couple of things. Number one, we all recognize that we have a syllabus. Now, I'm going to encourage each and every one of us uh, to have pen and paper and to make sure that you write down every single verse that we're going to be sharing because there's going to be a lot of information that is not going to be in the syllabus per se. Uh, we will refer to the syllabus if and when we need to do so, but it's just a basis or a structure that you can use for your own study time, but we're not going to go through every single piece of information in the syllabus. But I'd like to recommend to you, along with the syllabus, uh, the Time of the End magazine uh, by Brother Pippinger, if that will be available, and also the final rise and fall of the King of the North, another book as well that is also put out by the same uh, brother. So I would recommend that to you along with the syllabus, but we're going to be studying uh, the Bible this morning and throughout the presentations of the day. Now I want to say this, that Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, is the prophetic present truth message for the hour. It is the message of the third angel. Now, Elder Richards went through the experience of the third angel's message this morning, righteousness by faith. And we must understand that what Daniel 8.14 was to the Millerites, from 1840 to 1844, Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45, is to be to the 144,000. And as we see the first and second angel's message being connected to Daniel 8.14, Daniel 11, 40 to 45 contains the messages of the third and fourth angel's message. That as we see the midnight cry empowering Daniel 8, 14, so it is the loud cry of Revelation 18 that also empowers Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45. Now in verse 40 in Daniel chapter 11, uh, the Bible says here, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. We want to first understand from the Bible what is the time of the end. In order to do that, we're going to be allowing the book of Daniel to be able to answer that question for us. So let's go to Daniel chapter 12, just over the chapter. Daniel chapter 12. And let's notice what the Bible says in verse number 7, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7. The Bible says, And I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river, when he had held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever that it should be for a time, times, and a an half, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things should be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And so we see here the angel Gabriel is explaining that the time of the end is associated with the times, times, and a half, where the power of the holy people, or I should say the people of God, being scattered for a times, times, and a half a time. Now, in order to understand what the times, times, and a half a time is, or the time of the end, you'd simply go to the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation chapter 12, just write it down. Revelation chapter 12, verses 14 and 6. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, talks about the woman flying into the wilderness uh, from the face of the serpent to escape the papal flood of abominations and persecutions. She went into the wilderness, and she was there for a times, times, and a half of time. And then in verse number 6, it says that the woman fled into the wilderness where she was nourished and she was fed and protected as a city of refuge for 1,203 score days. So the times, times, and a half of time, or the time of the end, is the 1,260 days. But we know prophetically, according to Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34, that a day, for, a day equals a year in Bible prophecy. So the time of the end that we're talking about in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, is the 1,260 years from 538 to 1798, where we had the scattering 
under the uh, papal abomination of desolation of God's people. Now we see in Daniel chapter 11 verse 40, at the time of the end, it says the king of the south shall push at him. Now we need to understand and identify who the king of the south is and also the king of the north because that's what Daniel 11 is all about. But we're not talking about a literal king of the south or a little, literal king of the north. There are some prophetic rules of Bible interpretation that were put together by Mr. William Miller, the man according to early writings whom the angels of God came and opened his mind to the prophecies of Daniel Revelation, which had always been vague and mysterious and enshrouded in darkness and in error. So angels of God came and he put together some uh, principles of prophetic interpretation. You have all those rules, I believe, those 14 rules, you should have them in your syllabus. And then there was another man that came along in our time period, 1940, 1950, by the name of Lewis Weir, Elder Lewis Weir, Seventh-day Adventist, Australian pastor and evangelist, uh, wrote several books on Bible prophecy. One that's very important is called The Certainty of the Third Angel's Message. Every student of prophecy should have that book. Because he shows you how to trace the Old Testament uh, Bible prophecies. Through those prophecies, you see the three angels' messages or the everlasting gospel being illustrated. And one of those rules is, is this. Prophecy is understood before the time period of the cross to be in its literal local setting. Prophecy that is uh, fulfilled before the time period of the cross literal local in other words in the old testament you had a literal priesthood literal sacrifices literal offerings uh literalism literal kingdom of zion kingdom of jerusalem literal but when we come to the new testament dispensation or after the time period of the cross or under the dispensation of the spirit of god we no longer have a literal priesthood with literal sacrifices and literal temples but we have a spiritual priesthood we have spiritual sacrifices we have spiritual offerings and so thus we find 1798 is after the time period of the cross so we're not talking about a literal king of the south that would control geographically a literal uh, Egypt but we're talking about a spiritual king of the south that would control the spiritual characteristics of Egypt now in the book of Genesis chapter 12 you find that Abraham came out or rather Abram I should say came out of Babylon and he came out of Babylon by receiving the everlasting gospel. He had to exercise righteousness by faith just to come out of Babylon. And it talks about his travels. He went into the land of Canaan, passed through the land of Mori, but then he continued down according to Genesis 12, 9 and 10. Genesis 9 and 10, 12, 9 and 10, write it down. He continued down south until he went into the land of Egypt. Genesis 12, 9 and 10 puts Egypt in the region of the south. Now let's notice Isaiah chapter 30. Let's take our Bibles and let's turn to Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. And let's notice what the Bible says beginning with verses 2 and 3. Genesis 12, 9 and 10 shows us that Egypt is connected with the south. But now let's go to Isaiah chapter 30 and we're going to look at verses 2 and 3. Isaiah chapter 30 verses 2 and 3. And the Bible says thus, matter of fact, verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with the covering, but not of my spirits, uh, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of of Egypt. So Isaiah chapter 30 is talking about those that trust in the shadow of Pharaoh, those that trust in Egypt. Now let's drop our eyes down to verse 6 and verses 7 of the same chapter. Verse 6 says, the burden of the beast of the north, the burden of the beast of the south, into the land of trouble and anguish from whence come the young and or rather whence come the uh, young and the old uh, lion, the viper, the fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. So we're talking about Egypt. We're talking about Pharaoh trusting in the shadow of Egypt. And then in verse 6 it says, the burden of the beast of the south. And the nation that's under discussion here is Egypt. So we can say that those burden of the beast of the south, we're talking about those beasts that were in the southern region of Egypt. But now again, we're not talking about literal Egypt in 1798. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. 
Revelation chapter 11. 1798 is the time of the end. In Revelation chapter 11, let's notice what the Bible says beginning in verses 2 and 3. Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. The Word of God says, But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city uh, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. How long would the Gentiles tread down the holy city? For forty-two months. What is the forty and two months in Bible prophecy? Prophetic time. It's the 1260, verse 3. Verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So there it is right there in the same chapter, that the 42 months is the 1,260 days a year. So we're in the same time period, 1798. But now let's notice what takes place here to these two witnesses here. Because when we go to verse number 8, Verse 7 talks about a beast that was to ascend out of the bottomless pit to make war on those two witnesses, or the Old and the New Testament. Now, Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. The Bible says very plainly, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which literally is called Sodom and Egypt. Uh, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. You see, the literal comes before the spiritual. Or just like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 46. He says, that which was first is that which was natural, and then afterwards that which is spiritual. So literal comes, and then we have the spiritual. So we're talking about a spiritual Egypt here. And they have the two characteristics of Sodom and Egypt, or this great city called Sodom and Egypt spiritually. Now what was Sodom known for in Bible prophecy? We know according to Jude 1.7, write it down, Jude 1.7, the book of Jude 1.7, it speaks about Sodom and Gomorrah being overthrown and destroyed, being turned into a city of ashes. In fact, that's 2 Peter 2.6, but Jude 1.7 speaks about how Sodom and Gomorrah went after strange flesh and they gave themselves over to fornication, licentiousness, and immorality, and bestiality, and homosexuality, and all these sexual deviant sins. Jude 1.7, it classes Sodom with licentiousness and morality. But what about Egypt? Well, according to Exodus 5, verses 1 and 2, Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. You remember when Moses and Aaron went in before the court of Pharaoh. And they said, let my people go that they may worship me and serve me. And, and I've prepared a sacrifice for my people and I want them to worship me. But what did Pharaoh say? Pharaoh said, I know not. He said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And we understand that that represents characteristics of atheism and New Ageism, and also spiritualism as well, because Pharaoh believed himself to be the incarnate son of Ra, or the son of God, or God manifest in the flesh, so to speak. So atheism is noted for Egypt, and licentiousness is noted for Sodom. So we're talking about a nation during the 1798 time period which would have the characteristics of licentiousness and also the characteristics of atheism. And according to Great Controversy, page 269 to 270, in your syllabus you have this information, there's only one nation that could fulfill this prophecy, and it was atheistic France. So we're talking about the French Revolution time period. So we have the King of the South in 1798 being atheistic France, a revolution and atheism and licentiousness and spiritualism and secret society and all these other characteristics. But Daniel 11 verse 40 says at the time of the end, 1798, that the king of the south, atheistic France, would push at him, push at the king of the north. What does it mean to push? It means to war against. We understand that when people begin to fight, the first thing that they do, especially uh, as little kids, unconverted kids or worldly kids, I should say, you begin to start pushing and shoving one another. That's the beginning of the fight. But now let's turn our Bibles to the book of Psalms. Uh, Psalms 44. In Psalms 44. And I'd like to just remind you of Daniel chapter 8. Because you remember in Daniel chapter 8, we have two animals fighting each other. The ram and also the he-goat. 
We know that these nations represent the Medo-Persians and the Grecian Empire, but you see in Daniel 8, 4, the ram pushing a westward and northward and southward, and no one was able to stand before him until he was conquered by the uh, hairy goat or the nation of Greece under, under the kingship of Alexander the Great. So we recognize that to push is dealing with warring, it's dealing with fighting, but Psalms 44, Psalms 44, Notice what it says, Psalms 44, beginning with verse 4. Psalm 44 and verse 4. The Bible says, Thou art my King, O God, command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. Now what do you need a sword and a bow for? For war, you're fighting. So it's talking about pushing down our enemies through the name of God. It wasn't through the sword or by the bow or the military uh, genius of the Israelites that they won their battles. It was by the name and power of God that the Lord had fought for Israel. And so David was recognizing that it wasn't by the sword or by the bow. It wasn't by might. It wasn't by power, but it was by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And so now we're talking about uh, atheistic friends warring or fighting against the king of the north in 1798. Well, who was the king of the north? Let's take our Bibles now, and let's turn to the book of Ezekiel 26. And with all the spiritual platforms that we've just put in place, you should already know who the king of the north is. 1798, atheistic France warring against the king. Who else could it be but one power? In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 26... Beginning with verse 7. Ezekiel 26, verse 7. Ezekiel 26, verse 7 says, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings, from the east. Is that what it says? From the north. I'm just making sure that you're paying attention. King of kings, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar from the north. And the Bible goes on to say that he would come with horses and with chariots and horsemen and companies and much people. Don't forget that. The Bible here shows Nebuchadnezzar as the king of the north or the power that had ruled over geographical Babylon. And he comes with his horses and his chariots as well. Now you can write down Jeremiah 25.9. Jeremiah 25.9, it should be in your syllabus, but Jeremiah 25.9 it's just another text that gives a weight and witness to what Ezekiel is saying. Because upon the testimony of two, a thing is true. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And so we have one witness in Ezekiel, another witness is Jeremiah 25, 9. Where Jeremiah says that, Behold, because of you not hearkening to the law of God, nor my servants the prophets, he says that I'm going to take, I'm going to raise up and I'm going to take all the families of the north and Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, and I'm going to bring them against this land, even the land of Jerusalem, and this land will be destroyed and lay desolate 70 years. <clears throat> Jeremiah 25, verses 9 and 10. But now we're talking about 1798. So we're not talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar passed off the scene. We're talking about a spiritual king in the north. Now, it's interesting in Revelation 17. In Revelation 17, we have a woman that's clothed with scarlet. And purple, and she's sitting on a scarlet colored beast with seven heads and ten horns. She has committed fornication with the kings of the earth, and she has a golden cup of her in her hand full of the abominations of the filthiness of her fornication. But Revelation 17 5 says, and on her forehead there was a name written called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And we know in Revelation 17 that this is talking about the Roman Catholic papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, but she's in the wilderness. And so it's denoting that it's a certain time period where John is uh, taken in vision and he sees this woman in, on this scarlet colored beast. And we recognize that that is 1798 where she had received her deadly wound. But what I want to focus on is Mystery Babylon. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians 2 and let's look at verse number 7. We're focusing on mystery Babylon. We're talking about spiritual Babylon here, the king of the north. The Bible says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, the Bible says very clearly and very plainly, For the mystery of 
iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now the mystery of iniquity. Who is the mystery of iniquity? Mystery of iniquity is the same power that's mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17. The Antichrist of Bible prophecy. But let's back up to verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4 tells us very plainly who the mystery of iniquity is. Verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we're talking about the man of sin that exalts himself above God and all that is worshipped of God, and he's sitting in the temple showing himself that he is God, the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Now notice this is the man of sin sitting in the temple of God, but one of the things we have to recognize is this, that the king of the north has a dual nature. Not only are we talking about a religious power, but we're also talking about a civil power as well. We're talking about church and state here. But 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4 is emphasizing the religious aspect of the king of the north. His blasphemy and his self-exaltation against God. Now turn to Daniel 11 again. Go back with me to Daniel. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36. Remember how he would exalt himself against God. Above all that was called God or that is worshipped. Now Daniel chapter 11 Beginning with verse 36, the mystery of iniquity, mystery Babylon, the man of sin. Different prophetic terminologies, but same power because God likes to give variety in his word. Now the Bible says in Daniel 11 verse 36, Daniel 11 36 says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Amen. So we see very clearly that there's a connection. When, when Paul was talking about 2 Thessalonians 2-3, he was drawing the parallel and the analogy to Daniel chapter 11, verses 36. But in Daniel 11, 36, it's emphasizing both the political aspect, he's a king, but then he would also magnify himself above every god, the religious. So church and state here, the mystery of iniquity. So in 1798, the king of the north is Catholicism, uh, the, the papacy. And we know that in 1798, there was a war that took place between atheistic France and also the papacy. And this is where we get the deadly wound taking place. We read about the deadly wound in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. But in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, there is where the deadly wound is delivered in Scripture. But then the Bible talks about a time period where the king of the north would retaliate. The Bible says that he would come against him in the future. Later on, he would come against him as with a whirlwind. And with that whirlwind, he would come with chariots and with horses and many ships. What is this whirlwind? Go to Psalms 58 with me. Psalms 58. What is this whirlwind? Psalms 58. If you look at this world, word whirlwind, it talks about one who would be in the ascendancy. One who would uh, conquer this power. One that would sweep away in total annihilation and destruction. And I want you to notice in Psalms 58. Uh, Psalms 58 and verse 9. Psalm 58 and verse 9. The Bible says here in Psalms 58 verse 9, Before your pots can fill the thorns, he shall take them away as with a what? whirlwind both living and in his wrath associated with the whirlwind is the taking away or the sweeping away as it were but how would he sweep away the king of the south or well, with chariots and with horsemen but when it talks about taking him away taking him away how the bible says in proverbs chapter one proverbs chapter one the next book over proverbs one and let's notice what it says in verse 27. Proverbs 1.27. Proverbs 1.27. And there are other verses in your syllabus that we're not even turning to right now. There are more texts than Psalms and Proverbs to establish this truth. But Proverbs 1, verse 27. The Bible says, When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a 
whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you. So we're talking about sweeping away the king of the south or taking him out of the way with destruction to the point where he does not come back again or he is no longer a threat or a foe to the king of the north regaining his lost ascendancy or his temporal sovereignty that he lost in 1798. Now, the Bible says that he would come against them as a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen. What are the chariots and the horsemen that the papacy would use to sweep away and do away with, in total destruction, the modern king of the south? I want you to notice what the Bible says in the book of Exodus. Exodus 14. The book of Exodus, chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 9. Exodus 14, verse 9. What are the chariots and the horsemen that he would use in order to destroy his arched enemy or his arched foe, as it were? In Exodus 14, 9, But the Egyptians pursued after them, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army. So we see that associated with the chariots and with the horses and horsemen are Pharaoh's army or military power. Notice also in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 39, Ezekiel chapter 39, Ezekiel 39, beginning in verse 20, horses, chariots, armies, military might and ingenuity. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel 39 and verse 20, the Bible says thus, Ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. So we see here that again, associated with the horses and the chariots, Ezekiel 39, 20, we're talking about the men of war, the military might and power. All right, but what about the ships? Okay, because we see that the papacy would have military power and an army with him in order to deal with the king of the south. But what about the ships? Psalms 107. The book of Psalms 107. Psalms 107. And let's look at verses 23. Psalms 107, verses 23. Psalms 107. And also verse 23. And this is what the Bible says. The Word of God says, They that go down to the sea in ships that do business where? In the great water. So we see connected with uh, the seas are those that do great business in the waters. Or we're talking about economic power, economic resources. You also want to take note of Revelation 18. Revelation 18 Verses uh, 17 to 21, where you see the doom of modern Babylon. You see the plagues and her judgment coming upon her in one hour. In that chapter, you see the merchants of the earth weeping and wailing and casting up dust. Because so great riches have come to naught. Revelation 18, verses 17 to 21. So great riches has come to naught. And they were weeping and wailing because it was through the riches... Or it was through the abundance of Babylon's delicacies that all the merchants that had ships in the sea were made rich. So Revelation 18, 17 to 21, the ships are dealing with business or economic strength and power. So we're talking about the papacy. In order to annihilate off the face of the earth the king of the south, we're talking about he would use an army, military power. He would also use economic power as well in order to deal with the modern day king of the south. Now the Bible says that with the horses and chariots and with the ships, the Bible says in verse 40 that he would enter in through the countries and as he would enter in through the countries, he would enter in and he would overflow and pass over. Now, one of the things we need to recognize is this. At the beginning of Daniel chapter 11, verse 40a, some people say verse number a, at the beginning 1798, the king of the south was atheistic France, a single nation, 
with, a, with an ideology as well that was born out of the bottomless pit, a new manifestation of satanic power, according to the Great Controversy. But when the modern king of the South is swept away at the end of the world by the papacy and by that a nation that he would have an alliance with, we're talking about political and we're talking about economic strength, the king of the South will not be one single nation at the end of the world. It will be a, a conglomeration of many countries. In other words, it would be various countries or satellite countries that would have the same atheistic principles, the principles of revolution, the principles of spiritualism, the, the principles of the philosophies that come out from Egyptology. Now, Let's notice what it means when we talk about overflowing and passing over. Go with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 7. The papacy with military and economic strength would enter into the countries or into the dominion of the modern day king of the south and he would enter in through and he would overflow and pass over. Isaiah chapter 8, beginning with verse 7. Isaiah 8, verse 7. The Bible says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. Now that's interesting. Here we see that the king of Assyria is likened unto waters here. And sometimes when you look at Assyria in the Bible, sometimes Assyria also is in that same upper region of the north. So sometimes in the Bible, Assyria can be interchangeable with Babylon. You go back to Genesis 10. And in Genesis chapter 10, you see Nimrod's empire, the first king of Babylon, or where the Tower of Babel was built, where they built a city and a tower, church and state. You'll find that one of his kingdoms was also the city of Ashur, or what we understand to be Assyria. So connected with Assyria is Babylon. So this is very interesting here where we see Assyria because sometimes Assyria, even the haughty Assyrian, is also the king of the north too, in the, especially in the passages of the book of Isaiah. But now let's come and let's read this verse and finish it up here. It says, The king of Assyria, with all of his glory, being likened unto these uh, uh, waters of the river, strong and many, it says, And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks, and he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over, and he shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. So we see here the king of Assyria conquering Israel. And that's also interesting as well as we get into some of these other most wonderful and advanced uh, truths of the third angel's message when we see Assyria conquering Israel. And Israel was the northern tribe that was taken into captivity by Assyria. But I'm not going to say anything else about that. We'll find out later on. Jeremiah 47. Let's go to Jeremiah 47 now. Jeremiah 47. Jeremiah, what chapter did we say? 47. Notice what it says, beginning with verse 1. When we talk about overflowing, we're talking about conquering a nation, conquering the geography, conquering the dominion, or the rulership, or the stronghold of the king of the south, which would be made up of many countries. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 47, Verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines before that Pharaoh smote Gaza. Thus saith the Lord, behold, waters rise up out of the west, out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood. Notice the north and notice the overflowing flood. And shall overflow the land and all that is therein, the city and them that dwell therein, them, then the men shall cry and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl at the noise of the stamping of the hoofs of his strong horses. Notice the horses, the north, the overflowing flood, at the rushing of his chariots, notice the chariots, and at the rumbling of his wheels, the fathers shall not look back to their children for feebleness of hands. Because of the day that cometh to the spoil of all Philistines and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon every helper that remaineth. For the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Captor. So what do we see here? We see the Philistines being uh, conquered. 
by Egypt. And how did Egypt conquer the Philistines? Well, he, he, first of all, he came from the north. That's very interesting here. Came from the north, had the chariots and the horses and the overflowing flood, and the Philistines were conquered. And so thus we recognize Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, talking about how the king of north, the papacy, would enter in with horses and chariots and with many ships, and he would enter in through the domain of the king of the south, and he would overflow and pass over, or he would conquer that dominion. Now, I want you to take your syllabus, and I want you to turn to page 43. Take your syllabus and turn to page 43. Notice what the Bible, rather the spirit of prophecy says. Now, we just covered over 191 years of, prophetic, of history in verses 40. In 1798, all the way down to our current day and hour. Now, let's see this verse being fulfilled before our very eyes so that we can recognize where we are when we speak about the events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble these things have been clearly revealed and presented the multitudes of God's people here at the end of the world have no more understanding of these important and salvational truths than if they had never been revealed now I want you to notice, page 43, Manuscript Releases, volume 13, page 394, where it says similar scenes will take place. We have no time to lose. Are we there? We have no time to lose. Troublous times will be for us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel. What chapter of Daniel? The 11th of Daniel have, has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in the fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. And, and so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Verses 31 to 36 quoted, similar scenes to those described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon a time of trouble spoken of in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. What we see is this. The pen of inspiration gives us a prophetic pattern or a prophetic key in order to unlock and unseal correctly Daniel 11 verses 40 to 45 she points us to past history in Daniel 11 verses 30 to 36 where the papacy first took control of the world from 538 to 1798 that that history would be repeated when the King of the North in the last days would sweep away the modern day King of the South consisting of these various countries. Now how did the papacy take control of the world in the past? She didn't have her own army, nor her own economic strength. She had to borrow the economic strength and also the military power of the seven European kings of those seven horns in Daniel chapter 7. She had to come into a church-state relationship with the church over the state in order to manipulate and to guide and to ride the beast to further her uh, satanic ends. Now, notice when we look at this little note here, a very interesting note that we find here, right under this passage here, where she's talking about 30 to 36 in order to understand 40 to 45, as we know that the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. But it says, just as the papacy united with the barbarian tribes of pagan Rome in order to defeat a common enemy in the Aryan powers of the Huralai, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, and seat herself on the throne of the earth in 538 A.D., she once again in enlisted the military and economic strength of an ally, the United States of America, to defeat a common enemy in the USSR, charting her path to the throne of the earth once again. You see, brethren, the USSR, or the Soviet regime, was the inheritor of the crown of the king of the south. You see, one of the things that you read about and study in Daniel 11 especially verses 1 to 35, there's always a change of crowns and there's always a change of dominionship and rulership. 
It begins with the Medes and the Persians in verse number 1. But by the time you get to, and it talks about Greece, and then it gets to verse 14, it introduces Rome, pagan. And then from verses 14 all the way to 30, you have that history. But during those chapters and during those events, you see the crown of the king of the north and the crown of the king of the south always changing based upon who conquered the dominion or that geographical area of the north or of the south. But we're talking spiritually now. And so we see that the USSR embodies the same principles that were hatched during the French Revolution. Revolution and anarchy and, and atheism and spiritualism and all these things. We know what happened in 1989, 1991, 1992. As a matter of fact, February 24th, 1992, what we saw on the cover of Time magazine... Pope John Paul II and also Ronald Reagan coming together in a clandestine fashion for the demise of the Soviet Union. You could read all the statements. We have them for you in the syllabus. Time Magazine or Newsweek or Reader's Digest, whichever one you want to go through. It lets us know that in 1989, Daniel 1140... And the final events, the final movements, which would be rapid, were underway. But many people didn't recognize it. This is Revelation 13 coming together. The two beasts that are coming friends, as it were, working together. And this isn't anything new. God had already warned us about these things. You see that same pastor that I shared with you earlier, Pastor Lewis Weir. You see, in 1957, he wrote a track called the Preparing for the Close of Probation. And in that track, he begins to talk about Daniel chapter 11. And as he talks about Daniel 11, he talks about how one day the Vatican would unite with the Protestants in order to deal with, uh, with, with the Soviet regime or rather communism. This was 1957 where he predicted, just, just as a student of prophecy, just studying uh, Daniel and Revelation and the spirit of prophecy, this was 1957. 32 years later to the date in 1989, 1991, 92, it was fulfilled and the whole world saw it. The world newspaper, secular news writers recognized Mikhail Gorbachev as the world czar or king of atheism. And also Pope John Paul II, and it gives you all the prophetic analogies, pushing and the whirlwind and sweeping through and all of these various things you can read about it. But there was something that was even equally taking place, something more powerful. Not just with the collapse of the Soviet Union, but God was trying to let us know during that time period that we were literally living in the time period where the parable of the ten virgins was being repeated. The same thing that God did for the Millerites in 1840 to 1844, God was seeking to do it for His people in 1989. Just like the book of Daniel and the new light that came to it when you talk about the 2300 days and that which empowered the Millerite movement, God was seeking to do the same thing for His people. You see, brethren, on August 11, 1840, there was a mighty angel that came down from heaven. And the Bible says that he has a rainbow over his head. And he was clothed with the cloud. And his feet were like uh, pillars of fire. And his face shone like the sun. And he had one foot on the earth, one foot on the sea. And he had a little book open in his hand, which we know was the book of Daniel. And this was Christ, the mighty angel. Christ, the angel of Adventism, that was empowering the book of Daniel. Uh, confirming the year day principle when the sixth trumpet of the second woe, or the 391 years and 15 days, was fulfilled. Student of prophecy, they, student, uh, the brother the, who was a student of prophecy, Josiah Litch, two years before the prediction, just by studying the prophetic truths of the book of Revelation, came to understand that on August 11, 1840, that this power would fall. And it did so. And the atheists and the agnostics and the unbelievers and the gainsayers joined. And there was a wonderful impetus, a wonderful power that came into the movement. And the work rapidly extended. Now, brethren, in like manner, that same thing happened. It had the potential in 1989. Now, I want you to notice on the next page of verse 44. 1989. 
a power that comes from the bottomless pit, atheism, was collapsed. And the whole world saw it when the wall came tumbling down to let us know that we're under the events that are to bring about the, revive, the final revival and reformation among God's people. But now let's notice. Let's notice where it says still in the history of verse 40. Verse 40, or rather page 44. We are living in the time of the end. Now it's interesting because Daniel 11 verse 40 starts, starts off saying we're living, or rather at the time of the end. 1798. Now, Sister White here, in volume 9 to the testimonies of the church, page 11, says we're living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declared that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war pretentious, they forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. And then she says this, and on one occasion, when in New York City, in what city? Yeah. New York City, I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof, and they were erected to glorify the owners and builders higher and still higher. These buildings arose, and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belong were not asking themselves how can we best glorify God. The Lord was not in their thoughts. The scene the next pass before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe, but these buildings were consumed as if made of a pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. And brethren, I believe that this is a fulfillment of September 11th, 2001. Now, it goes on to say, the world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. So notice, she's talking about the time of the end. And then she talks about September 11, 2001. And then she says the world is stirred with the spirit of war that the prophecies of the 11th of Daniel have nearly reached their complete fulfillment. In other words, she's putting the final fulfillment or the nearly completed fulfillment of Daniel 11, she's associating it with what happened on September 11, 2001. She says then after that the world was stirred with the spirit of war. Tell me something, was the world stirred with the spirit of war after 9-11? We've been in this, what, this six years now, seven year war with, with the Americans and the Iraqis? Right after 9-11, world stirred with the spirit of war. Daniel 11, connected with 9-11. But we're talking about the final fulfillment, the verses 40 to 45. But something else took place. Notice this statement here, Review and Herald, July 5th, 1906. How comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave? This I have never said. I have said as I looked at the great buildings going up there, story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18, 1 and 3 will be fulfilled. The whole, Revelation 18, 1 and 3 will be fulfilled. The whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth, but I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming on New York, only that I know that one day, the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power from the light given me. I know the destructions in the world. One word from the Lord, one touch of his mighty power, and these massive structures will fall. Scenes will take place, the fearfulness of which we cannot imagine. So not only on 9-11 did those buildings come down, but she says Revelation 18, 1 and 3 will be fulfilled. Now you go and see what Revelation 18, 1 to 3 is saying. It talks about the mighty angel coming down from heaven to lighten the earth with his glory. And that also is Christ, the mighty angel. Same angel, Jesus Christ, that came down at the beginning of Adventism. August 11, 1840, six uh, trumpet second woe. 9-11, the mighty angel Christ, who is going to be the ending of Adventism or bring Adventism to a completion, 9-11, comes down. And just like on August 11, 1840, he had a little book open in his hand. That was Daniel 8, 14. And the clarification thereof, 
On 9-11, Christ the mighty angel came down and descended, and he also had the little book open in his hand, and it was the book of Daniel, but not just any portion of the book of Daniel. It was verses, it was chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, that he was opening to his students of prophecy as the lion of the tribe of Judah to empower them and to show them that now, based upon the prophetic message, that now we were beginning to live during the time period of the latter rain, beginning to be sprinkled. The latter rain message, Daniel 11, 4 to 45, not the latter rain experience, the latter rain prophetic message. But notice what it goes on to say. Notice what it goes on to say. That was 1906. Listen to what she says here, April 21st, 1891. The latter rain is to fall upon the people of God. Almighty angels to come down from heaven. And the whole earth is to be lightened with his glory. Notice, she says the latter rain is to fall upon God's people. And then she says the mighty angel is to come down from heaven. That's the angel of Revelation 18. Then she says, are we ready to take part in the glorious work of the third angel? Are our vessels ready to receive the heavenly dew? Have we defilement and sin in the heart? If so, let us cleanse the soul temple and prepare for the showers of the latter rain. The refreshing from the presence of the Lord will never come to the hearts filled with impurity. May God help us to die to self that Christ, the hope of glory, may be formed from within. Amen. Where the mystery of God can be finished. Where it's not just Christ in you, the hope of glory, but we're talking about presenting every man perfect in Christ Jesus, where we'll be able to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And who shall be able to stand, brethren? The 144,000. God was empowering His people with the message of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the seventh trumpet, the third woe, paralleling the sixth trumpet, the second woe. That as the whole world came together to deal with Islam, August 11th, 1840, well, right after 9-11, the whole world came to deal with Islam. And at this point, it doesn't matter whether you believe that Islam was responsible for 9-11 or not, but the whole world came to deal with them. It was showing us, brethren, that we're in the history, the repeating of the history of the Millerite time period. Yeah. Under this time where he's developing the 144,000. Now, lastly, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 242. Because some say, well, what, about, what do you mean about this sprinkling? Fullness of the outpouring of the latter rain takes place at the Sunday law when the loud cry of the third angel's message begins to go forth. Yes, I agree. But I also believe that the latter rain has the component of a prophetic message that is designed to revive and to strengthen and also reform the people to allow them to see that they need the experience of the third angel's message, righteousness by faith. It's the prophetic message that convicts us through the Holy Spirit of sin, Righteousness and judgment. Why would you want to be clothed with Christ's righteousness when you are rich and increased with goods and don't think you don't have need of anything, but you don't know that you're poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked? It takes an Elijah message. It takes a John the Baptist message. It takes the prophetic word to bring us to life, to bring back the valley of those dead, dry bones and cause them to come together. God begins to sprinkle the latter rain in the form of a prophetic message. Upon his people. Listen to what she says here. The act of Christ. And breathing upon his disciples the Holy Ghost. And imparting his peace to them. Was as a few drops before the plentiful shower. To be given on the day of Pentecost. So just before the full outpouring on the day of Pentecost. They had an imbuing or a breathing upon them. Which was as a few drops. That was in John chapter 20. Why did, God, why did Jesus do that? That was to prepare them to get into the upper room, brethren. Amen. They would have never been able to be led in the upper room without that sprinkling of that breathing of the Holy Ghost. And then they got in that upper room, and then they began to pray, and they began to confess their sins, put away differences, and then they also study prophecy, brethren. Because you can't go out on the day of Pentecost and have an incorrect prophetic word or message. Amen. They had to have the correct message. They had to go and prophesy again, get it right. But it was accomplished by the breathing of the Holy Spirit. And so in our day, before the fullness of the showers fall, we must also expect that also there will be showers of blessing, a sprinkling through the prophetic word to prepare us to see that we need to be in Christ. We need to have the righteousness by faith experience and then be prepared for the full outpouring of the latter rain. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're living in serious times. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. So many prophetic events of great 
of the greatest magnitude are taking place. The agencies of evil are combining and consolidating their forces. Already we can see that those who, ro who hold the reins of government are not, those who hold the reins of, of business and of government are not able to solve the problems or to place business operations on a more secure basis. The economic crisis of Bible prophecy, 9-11 taking place, the repeat of Millerite history, demonstrating that we're in the time period of which Bible prophecy calls the latter rain. We're to ask for it. We're to pray for it, the early and latter rain. And I pray that through the, the mighty angel, Christ Jesus, who has that little book open in his hand, that we, like John, would take the book and eat it, even Daniel 11, 40 to 45, that we might have that experience where we can truly be sanctified, truly have Christ within us, the hope of glory, and truly have the experience of the blotting out of sins. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.